Welcome everybody to the um, third of the calls by the Staff Student Solidarity Network, which we've been organising over this um, summer period. The topic of this call is um, the militant practice of workers' inquiry. Um, we're having a session on this call today because the kind of theme of the call throughout the summer has been expanding on some of the work that we are doing as a Solidarity Network during the last kind of cycles of struggles through the UCU strikes and other university campaigns. And a discussion amongst a few of us, we recognise that workers' inquiry is something which is becoming more and more prominent in kind of activist and worker circles. It'd be good that we engage with it as a solidarity network. Um, we, as the solidarity network, we are built as a kind of organisation network throughout the, the, you know, the final, the last few years of um, UCU strikes and different campaigns on campus. Um, and the kind of core of it is really that we're trying to break down the institutional and bureaucratic barriers between staff and work, between students and workers at the university. So we can you know, recognize that politically we have to be kind of united in some sense to engage in meaningful, meaningful solidarity. You know, we're endlessly put into the distinct silos and reproduce the dynamic of just consumers and producers. And we'd hope this kind of network that we're running and organizing within is gonna be one of the tools to break down these, like the barriers, which ensure we kind of remain quite politically weak within the university space. So that's kind of background to the teach outs as a whole. And as I said, you know, the workers inquiry, it's something we've had a, a few of us have an interest in within the network as a whole. So we thought it'd be worth pursuing, you know, even if it's just discussions and kind of education between us or can building to something more kind of long term as an actual inquiry project, particularly, you know, as there's lots of avenues we could go down within universities as it's not something that's been pursued a huge amount in the UK. And, you know, there's students involved who are interested in student inquiry as well. So we thought we'd start this as a, an initial teach out on the topic. Um, so the plan for tonight's teach out is to offer both a kind of historic account of workers inquiry um, for people who've never in encountered the practice and then to move on to kind of more specific accounts of what workers inquiries have been, how they're done, what they might be useful for, maybe some of the flaws of them as well. And then to slowly move on to kind of more concrete forms of inquiry within the university space, within the University of Edinburgh, some insights on what that might mean for us to be engaging with them. And then after that, um, we'll have a short break and then move into a kind of open discussion and um, a chance for everyone to offer some reflections and maybe planning toward the future. Um, so joining us tonight um, as people organising the call with people from the Solidarity Network of Sophia and Fred, we're hosting the call. And then we're going to be hearing firstly from um, Clark McAllister, who's a scholar and activist um, in the Scottish political world. Um, he's going to be speaking on the history of workers' inquiry. So we can offer kind of some of the context and the background to the practice before going into kind of the greater detail of like contemporary workers inquiry. We're also going to be hearing from Jamie Woodcock, who is a lecturer at the Open University, a member of the Notes from Below Collective, and also a kind of activist and researcher who works on workers inquiry and workers struggle here in the UK. In a similar vein, we're being joined by Robert Ovitz from over in America, who's a lecturer at San Jose State University and a researcher on workers struggle and inquiry. He's going to be speaking about his um, experience organizing around strike threats in America. After that, we're going to hear from Sophia Lacouris, who's going to be speaking about the kind of social and affective element of inquiry um, that we could, you know, pursue within our own practices up here in Edinburgh. And then narcissistically, I'm going to speak very briefly at the end for discussion about why we've been taking an interest in, uh, in workers' inquiry up here in Edinburgh and also an element of what it might mean for students to be engaged in inquiry as people who reproduce the university in many ways, who engage in labour productively, have a massive political presence. I'm going to speak a little bit on that and then we're going to have a break and then lead into the discussion. Perfect. Okay, so first I'm going to park, pass over to Clark. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, Dan. And yeah, thanks everyone for joining our teacher on Workers' Inquiry today. I'm basically going to begin this session by just discussing what Workers' Inquiry is, what it means, its significance, its origins, and particularly our own thoughts on it and why we think it's an important method of investigation. And I'll also discuss as well, just a few of the historical currents that have really pioneered and shaped the development of this form of research. Um, I'll also kind of focus on one or two particular case studies of inquiries and just show and demonstrate how they have been able to produce particular, particular knowledge about the labor process. So first of all, uh, what is a worker's inquiry? What does it mean? Basically, this is a form of investigation into work or into the labor process from the point of view of the working class. That is, it proceeds from workers' own direct subjective experiences of work 
and how work relates to other aspects of life. So we kind of seek to explore and write about how all the necessities of life under capitalism seem to kind of converge and rotate around this center of gravity of work and its apparent necessity. So what really distinguishes workers' inquiry from other approaches to the study of labor is that, you know, conventional, traditional approaches, traditional academia, traditional sociology, as valid as these are, and indeed we have a lot to learn from them, they kind of have a tendency to view the labor process from above, or at the very least, via some proximity of distance. And a good Marxist critique of this is that, although this kind of empirical observation is definitely capable of pr producing very accurate knowledge, we nonetheless feel that this is incomplete, that this knowledge is limited. Workers' inquiry, on the other hand, we maintain is capable of articulating a more authentic working class epistemological position in relation to capitalism. And workers' inquiry can do this because it actually gets involved in the labor process itself. It actually gets bound up in the thing itself. As an old saying goes, you've got to bite into and taste the fruit in order to really know the fruit. And workers' inquiry kind of does that. And perhaps by virtue of this, we could even say that a workers' inquiry maybe even allows the labor process to kind of speak for itself. Or at the very least, it helps articulate the political voice and the political logos of workers. So workers' inquiry can take lots of different forms. This can be a questionnaire, interview with workers, uh, a workplace ethnography, probably most effectively actually conducting work and cooperating with other workers. And doing this helps to yeah, find out more about the labor process. And it's important to note that it's not merely a form of research. It's not just academic. Workers' inquiry is also a political activity. And it's oriented politically towards organizing working class power, toward the emancipation of labor. And traditional academia, valuable as it is, tends not to be associated with organizing working class power. So that's really our kind of starting point. And that's just a rough sketch of the kind of theories of workers' inquiry and its aims and its goals. Now, its actual origins, this goes back to Marx himself. Before Marx, there was no doubt many different kinds of investigations into labor relations. But it's really only with the Marxist critique of capitalism that we can speak of workers' inquiry, because it's really only under the total system of capitalist production that we have the reality of work as such that we have work organized as a necessity and a compelling for the selling of labor power. So anyone who's read Capital will no doubt be aware of the work of British factory inspectors. And these were appointed by the British government in response to strikes and agitation amongst the workers to basically investigate different sectors of industry and to compile reports about living and working conditions. And this type of research was invaluable in allowing Marx to complete his own socioeconomic research. But like those academic approaches that we discussed, there's a tendency here to kind of view the labor process from a distance. A factory inspector is not necessarily a proletarian. So in order to bridge this gap, Marx created and composed what's generally considered to be the first worker's inquiry or worker's inquiry. And this took the form of a very long questionnaire, very detailed, very precise, 100 questions, and this was posed towards French workers. And in this text, Marx states that it's only the workers who can actually articulate with positive and full knowledge the realities of their own situation, and that it's only the workers and not representative saviors who can actually have the ability to transform those situations. So two main points that Marx outlines here, knowledge about work and the transformation of situations. Now, unfortunately, Marx didn't receive any responses to this questionnaire, or at least there's none that we know of. But nonetheless, it's still a really important starting point for the subsequent history of workers' inquiry, because the first really successful and fruitful attempts 
the compose inquiries throughout the 20th century, a lot of them take Marx's original document as their theoretical and practical starting point. Now, I'm thinking mainly here of groups like the Johnson Forest Tendency from America, a very prominent group organizing in the 40s and the 50s. Now, the Johnson Forest Tendency were a collection of militants, Marxist scholars, and academics, mainly centered around the work of CLR James and Raya Donayevskaya. And they're using pseudonyms to evade censorship and McCarthyist persecution. And the Johnson Forest Tendency, in cooperation with workers, produced quite a number of what we would today consider to be early workers' inquiries. And they explored all kinds of relations of work, about race relations, about gender relations. They looked at factory work and household work. And I think it's important here just to discuss briefly one of these inquiries, just to give everyone a taste of, of kind of what it revealed about the labor process. So one member of the Johnson Forest tendency, Grace Lee Boggs, in cooperation with a young worker called Phil Singer from an automobile factory in America, composed a, a text called The American Worker. The second part of this was written by Grace Lee Boggs, kind of theoretical exposition. And the first part was Singer's own comments um, about work itself. And in this text, Singer really explores the relationship between work and free time. And he exposes how this is not an equal relationship, how in fact it's a very one-sided relationship and it's dominated by work. So in chapter 10 of Capital, when Marx describes this great victory of the workers' movement, this limitation of the working day, where workers are able to distinguish between what's their own free time and what's working time or time for capital. Well, according to Singer, that even with a five-day working week and a, an eight-hour working day, work still dominates. And so even in free time, a worker's mind is still perpetually attacked and even colonized by capital and the necessity and the drudgery of work. And he articulates this by talking about his own and his fellow workers' experience, for example, on Friday nights when they leave the factory, the experience in their heads, in their homes, the echo of the booming machinery of the factory, and that it takes a while for this experience to subside and fade away. And when it does, no sooner has free time been realized where a worker can spend time with their family or their friends, do whatever the hell they want, then the worker is then compelled into saying, Ah, I can't have a beer. I've got work in the morning. And as trivial as this kind of thing sounds, what Singer is really articulating here is that for most people under capitalism, life has to be structured around work, and work isn't structured around life. Another example of this, workers waking up at the weekend, putting on their overalls, grabbing their lunch, and heading into the factory, only to realize, well, what am I doing? It's a Saturday. And this really speaks to Marx's theory of reification and of the process of the subsumption of labor by capital and the subjection of labor by capital. We have a real infiltration of the dynamics of work into the body beyond consciousness, because it's not a conscious choice to do this. I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, but I used to do that when I was at school. Sometimes I wake up on a Saturday morning and go and get ready and then realize, oh wait, it's, it's, uh, it's Saturday, what am I doing? So this really speaks to the effect of capital's constant attack on the subconscious of the worker. And the American worker is also really significant in another sense. Perhaps, dare I say, for the first time in the history of the critique of capital, Singer actually outlines here the really dynamic ways in which workers express and convey that antagonistic relationship between a worker and between capital. And this is done not, not simply through uh, joining a trade union or, or joining a political party or even going on strike, as important as these activities are. This opposition can actually be expressed in work itself, in the ways in which workers are working. So Singer writes, when the plan of capital dictates a speeding up of the assembly line in order to produce more, more commodities, more units, the workers often spontaneously organize a process known as auto-limitation or a slowdown. 
And this doesn't mean the workers aren't working. They continue to work, but they do so at a rate of pace that they feel comfortable with. They actually exercise their own will over the production process within limits. And this is because they realize that this excessive fast-paced toil in order to create capital is not conducive towards the development of a healthy individuality. And likewise, the competition that it foments amongst workers is incommensurate and incompatible with healthy cooperation, which is necessary even in capitalist relations of production. So what he's articulating here is an early kind of form of workers engaging against work, going on strike, feeling jubilant at leaving the factory, and also the ways in which workers wish to control work and not be commanded by capital, to actually have autonomy over their own labor. So before I finish, we'll move briefly, transport ourselves over to over the Atlantic, back to continental Europe, a little bit closer to home. Because in the works of the Johnson Forest tenancy were translated into French and Italian in the 50s and the 60s. They had a really explosive effect. And we begin to see in this period all sorts of activists and scholars beginning to destroy this distinction between intellectual and manual labor and actually go out into the countryside, into factories, and organize with workers and produce a more autonomous kind of knowledge. And one of the most significant attempts to create workers' inquiry in Europe was conducted by a pioneering Marxist sociologist from Italy, Romano Alquati, and his work um, working with workers in Turin and uh, the Fiat factories and the big automobile plants there. This was really associated with not just himself, but other scholars, editors of a journal called Quaderni Rossi, the Red Notebooks. I'm thinking here of Mario Tronti and Antonio Negri. And these thinkers, through basing their thoughts in a large part on workers' inquiries and on the results of inquiries, were able to create a completely new theory of Marxism, one that historian Steve Wright has designated as the great Copernican revolution in Marxist thought. And we hear of Copernican revolutions in philosophy from time to time, maybe just one significant one. But I think this is really important, really legitimate, because this thought has been articulated or expressed as a tendency, as a theory, and as a movement. And it's called workerism or operismo. And it proceeds from workers' own thoughts and their own experiences of, of labor and of capital, not from what the trade unions say, and not from what the communist parties say. Because at this time, in both France and Italy, when we see this huge intensification of class struggle and this huge explosion of class struggle, the official communist parties tended to oppose the workers and they tended to stand against the workers. So against this, the militants of Quaderni Rossi were developing this theory of workerism and theories of the mass worker and class composition theory, the ways in which workers politically organize when capital innovates and restructures the division of labor. And all of these things are ultimately the product of workers' inquiries and seeing what workers are actually doing on the shop floor itself, and not necessarily taking the words of their representatives as gospel. So this class composition theory is being pioneered today, and it's experiencing a big resurgence. Uh, groups like Notes from Below, um, who take this as a kind of theoretical starting point, and also some other groups like Angry Workers, who are beginning to uh, involve themselves, published a really good book recently, uh, Class Power on Zero Hours, and this is about organizing and conducting inquiries uh, in England. And if you're interested in learning a bit more about this, then we've compiled a Google Doc, which you can access on our Facebook event description. And detailed here is a list of sources that basically explain a bit more about these concepts in more detail, a bit more about these tendencies. But I won't talk any longer, especially not about what's occurring in Britain today, because we have some great guests that can explain a bit more about this. So, I'll pass over to Jamie now, uh, if you can hear me, and we can begin to hear a bit more about his work conducting inquiries. Thanks. Thank you so much. And I, I want to apologize first for being late for the meeting. Um, it's a terrible thing to turn up late to a meeting that you're speaking at, so I, I apologize. Um, but I was in a union meeting and we had to vote on some stuff, so I couldn't leave until 
made sure that the vote had gone gone the right way. Um, so I want to, yeah, I want to say thanks for inviting me to to come and speak. I also want to say thanks to the to Clark for the introduction. Um, of what I heard, that was a, a really excellent overview. Um, and I think it's a really wonderful thing to to get people together and talk about this and rediscover some of these ideas and think about think about how we can we can put them into practice. So yeah, I think it's great to have great to have a talk like this. I think you know I don't want to take too long uh, in my talk. Um, I want to say three things really. I think, and then it would be really great to kind of hear about people's experience and questions that people have and have a bit more of a kind of a discussion about things because you know if we're talking about workers inquiry and breaking down the subject and researcher and insider outsider thing you obviously don't want to hear from from me talking for ages and not have a chance to to disagree and to argue about it as well um, but i want to say three things i mean the first thing i want to say is it's slightly autobiographical and i'll apologize for that but it does have a point to it um, of how I came into to doing organizing like this and thinking about workers inquiry because I think it might have have some relevance for, for what you're all thinking about uh, with this project um, is in what feels like a long time ago but wasn't that long ago when I did my PhD uh, in London in, in Goldsmiths um, I was starting to do a project about call center work. So I worked in a call center for a while and tried to organize it and, and wrote it up as a, as, a, as a PhD. And alongside that, um, I was teaching at Goldsmiths. So I was teaching people about Marxism on a dodgy contract um, and thinking about, you know, what we could do to start organizing and what was happening to the university and so on. And there were a group of us who were reading about inquiries thinking about how we didn't really understand our own contracts, thinking about how we didn't understand how we related to other people in the university. Um, and so we did our own, our own inquiry at Goldsmiths. Um, and I'd be happy to dig it up uh, for people if anyone's interested. I mean, I think quite a lot has, has changed in those number of years since we did it. Um, but I think, you know, in the university context, I think inquiry, um, can be a good starting point for thinking about what it means to do research and organizing. You know, particularly if we've been trained as academic researchers, because that brings with us all manner of baggage and, uh, and, and problems for thinking about doing inquiry. But it also means thinking about our own work, um, thinking about the work of other people in the university, um, you know, thinking about how we relate to capital in various ways. And, you know, I, I caught a bit in the introduction talking about Marx's survey. Um, and we actually thought of, we did a survey ourselves to start things off. Um, and I think, you know, we didn't have 101 questions or whatever it was. We had, we had slightly fewer. But I think we can think about how some of these tools can be used as an intervention. Um, so we did a survey. We didn't really, we weren't that interested in what the survey would produce. Um, I mean, it gave a chance to talk to people about, do you have a contract? You know, have you read your contract? What's your hourly pay and so on? But what we used the survey for was an excuse to go around and knock on every single door in the university. Um, so we went door to door in every department. We had leaflets with the survey on and it became an organizing tool because when people answered the door, you know, we didn't say straight away, we want to cause a load of trouble. We want to organize PhD students that are teaching. Instead, we said, hi, we're running a, a survey for PhD students. You know, do you want to talk to us? Do you want to know about what's happening in another department and so on? So it provided this kind of entry point for, for talking to people about their work. Um, and although it was an online survey, we printed it out. You know, I'm still a big fan of, of handing things to people and, and having a discussion over them. And I think it was useful for a number of reasons. The first is, uh, we discovered that there was a massive issue uh, for a, a particular section of, of PhD students that taught uh, and for precarious academics. And this was the way that your hours were declared if you were claiming uh, tax credits, so uh, tax credits around uh, child tax credits. Uh, lots of people were losing them because the amount of hours that it said they worked was very different to what they worked. Uh, and so we were able to have a very quick win for, for our organizing of getting people's hours reclassified and they, they got access to child tax benefits again. 
Um, and so we got a quick win, didn't cost the university anything, um, you know, made a huge difference to, to these workers that you know, were struggling on, on low wages. But you know, as a young man at the time, wouldn't have been something I would have thought of. Uh, you know, didn't occur to me that that would be one of the organizing issues, but it came up through our discussions with these surveys. Um, we then used the, the results to go door to door again and host meetings about what was happening in each department. So to kind of present the results and found out that conditions were really different uh, between each department. Um, so got people talking about their pay, comparing it to other people and breaking down many of the barriers that managers had, had put up to, to treat people unequally in the university. Um, this kind of project then, in a way, fed in eventually to, to the Notes From Below project um, of thinking about how we can do inquiries and tie them into, into organizing in, in one way or another. And I think particularly in the university context, a lot of this is focused around uh, building connections between academics, administrative workers, cleaners, security guards. And I think, you know, there's an implicit moment in workers' inquiry, which is before you want to organize, you need to figure out what's going on. And this is something everyone does. You know, if you want to organize at work, you have to figure out what you're organizing against, what you're organizing for. And I think politically, it can be a really important lesson for people, particularly in the university, to go and talk to security guards, to go and talk to cleaners, to hear about their experiences, to talk to them about what it's like to work in the university. And so in Notes From Below, we've hosted a number of uh, workplace bulletins for cleaners, for security guards. Um, we have a very long running one for academics, which we've used to cause trouble at various points um, called the university worker. But thinking about how you can use inquiry across the whole of the campus, and not just limited to you know, the sectoral basis, the craft basis that a lot of our unions organize in uh, at present already in the campus. And then I just wanna say two things about notes from below. Um, the first thing is when I think about inquiry, uh, I think of inquiry as the kind of snapshot on a working condition, you know, delving into what's happening in a workplace delving into the experiences, the struggles, the ways people are resisting and so on. And I think whilst that on its own is, is a valuable thing to do, you know, we should be figuring out about our work and other people's work. Uh, at Notes From Below, we use a kind of framework to analyze these inquiries, um, which is thinking about class composition. Uh, and for me, we can think perhaps of inquiry as the practice and class composition as the framework to make sense of, uh, of inquiries. And we're running a project at the moment where we, we have 10 different workers from different sectors across, uh, across the UK who are writing about their work. Um, so from you know, a delivery rider, uh, a security guard, a bar worker, um, you know, a, a whole range of different work, workplaces. And we've kind of used this framework and tried to figure out how we can use it to help people doing their own inquiries. And so broadly, when we talk to people about writing up their experience, we try and do it across three, three categories. Uh, the first is, what is your technical composition, the technical composition of your work? How is the labor process organized? How are you managed? What kind of technology is used? How are you controlled? You know, the kind of the granular bits about work uh, that affect, affect our experience of it in various ways. Uh, we then think about the social composition of workers. So how are workers composed outside of the workplace? Where do they live? You know, what kind of communities are they part of? What is the effect of oppression in various ways? Uh, you know, what are the, the roots of migration that might be involved? Um, what's the relationship to the state? How does this affect people's experience of work and how they can, how they can struggle? Um, and this is something that, is from notes from below, we have kind of added to the traditional kind of uh, workerist or, or Italian uh, operaismo framework of class composition, which saw the relationship between technical composition and political composition. Um, and we kind of added social composition, partly because of many of the inquiries we were looking at, the way work was organized had an effect on the way people struggled 
forms of political composition, the ways they resist, the, the modes of, of fighting back. But we increasingly found that social composition played a really important mediating role. Um, so particularly around migration, uh, you know, with gig work, for example. And so the idea here is that you can read off from the technical and social composition potential forms of political composition, how people fight work. And I think at notes from below, this has really been central for us, is that it is about searching for moments of, of strength, of potential, of figuring out not only why work is, is shitty, you know, has problems with it, but figuring out how we're going to change it. And so focusing on new forms of political composition that emerge has been a really uh, important part of, of the project. And then I guess just to, to kind of finish on the, 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 the final point is in terms of conducting inquiries and encouraging other people to do inquiries. I think we, we really feature three main things at, at Notes from Below. The first is worker self-writing. Um, so encouraging workers to write about their own experience, um, using that as a process to build networks with other people, to better understand their work and make sense of what's happened. Forms of co-writing, um, so supporting people to make sense of their experience. Uh, many people are not encouraged to write, are not confident to write, um, but want to, to, to take part in that process. And then bulletins. Um, so by this I mean kind of leaflets, so producing workplace leaflets, you know, writing, getting somebody in the workplace to write one and to hand it out to other people. Um, and in a way this sounds quite old fashioned, um, but it's about using, using a method to reach out to people and to build kind of concrete connections uh, in workplaces. And then the final part is, is kind of more theoretical pieces, but these are the things that are driven by by the inquiries themselves. And I guess what I want to conclude on is to say, you know, I think there's an attraction to an inquiry from a university context about saying that research can play a role in working class struggle, um, you know, can contribute to, to the labor movement and to, to a revolutionary politics. And I think that's certainly true, but I think what we have to be incredibly careful of is seeing that research comes in many different forms and that for it to be an inquiry in a, in a sense that we might be talking about in this meeting, the research has to involve organizing and the organizing has to involve some kind of research. So it's about actively thinking through the process, not just about producing you know, a nice written thing uh, at the end of it, but intervening in a struggle uh, and, and seeking to use that political knowledge for something. Um, and if it's not engaging in a struggle, you know, it's, it's an interesting piece of research. Uh, and so the question is like, how do we bring those two things into conversation productively uh, in order to, to engage in some kind of fight uh, or struggle? Um, yeah, thank you very much. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Jamie. Now, uh, Robert Ovitz. Hi, I'm Robert Ovetz. I'm a lecturer at San Jose State University. Just give me a moment. I'm going to pull up uh, some slides that I'm going to use. So I've been focusing on the university um, as a, a key part of capitalism. Uh, since I was a graduate student. And uh, I continue this work as a contingent lecturer. Um, and uh, in the spirit of what Jamie was just talking about, of doing, applying um, the, the skills and experience of being a researcher to my own struggles in the university. Um, and I, I appreciate uh, both Clark and, and Jamie's uh, both historical and conceptual overviews of workers' inquiry. And so I'm gonna kind of narrow it down a little bit to tell you a little bit about a chapter that I wrote in a book that's coming out in late October uh, with Pluto Press um, and um, that I edited. 
on uh, global workers inquiries that include inquiries from uh, nine different countries around the world um, and a number of different industrial sectors, including education. And um, so this uh, inquiry is, is part of a larger project that I, I launched several years ago uh, looking at uh, strike threats. And um, in the United States, um, for the last uh, decade or so, uh, the number of strike threats has exceeded uh, the number of actual strikes. And so what I decided to do was um, an investigation into strike threats and to determine whether or not the strike threats are credible or whether they're a symbolic kind of maneuvering. And I decided to turn the focus in on my own experience uh, at the time in 2015 and 16, when my union, uh, the California Faculty Association, uh, had threatened to go on strike uh, in September 2015. And considering that, I, I think many of y'all are uh, members of UCU and you've gone through actual several strikes. Uh, strikes are quite rare in the United States, at least until the pandemic. Um, there have been over 600 strikes in the last few months in the U.S., uh, almost all wildcat strikes. But before that, uh, we went into a, a, a multi-decade dearth of strikes. However, I found that the number of actual strike threats was far exceeding the actual number of strikes in the United States. So I wanted to look at it from the context of being a lecturer and a member of the union. And at the time, I taught on two different campuses, uh, San Francisco State. Um, and uh, San Jose State. Um, so this is uh, just an a image of the website that I developed where I encourage uh, workers and organizers and union staff to, uh, to track and report uh, their strike threats. So just released it a few months ago. So what is, what's a, a credible strike threat? Um, there's, there hasn't really been a lot of thinking about strike threats uh, in the labor studies uh, literature or among unions. Really, the concept is not really much discussed, although um, it's often used as a tactic. Um, so the way that I def define a strike threat, and I, I've got to fix this slide because it's uh, getting covered up here. So the way I define a credible strike threat um, is in the following way in, in the chapter, is that not all strike threats are credible. For a strike threat to be credible, it must fulfill two criteria. Uh, first, it must convince the employer not only that the workers are prepared to strike, but that the cost of a strike will be higher than making a concession to settle the dispute before the strike happens. Second, in order to convince the employer, it must also convince a supermajority of workers that a strike will succeed in realizing their objectives and persuade them to get involved. A strike threat that is credible to the employer, whether it's called uh, as a sick out or as a walkout, uh, is one in which the preparations are perceived by the employer to likely result in a strike that will first be more costly than conceding to all or some of the workers' demands in order to avoid it. So starting from this perspective, I wanted to look at uh, whether or not our strike threat was credible. Um, I developed this kind of uh, way to relate uh, these more uh, well-known uh, ideas of uh, organizational, positional, and disruptive power. Um, these are uh, at least the first two of organizational and positional power um, are uh, more well-known concepts in uh, labor studies and employment relations and so forth. Um, and I looked at how they relate to uh, disruptive power, which is a, a, a more recently emerging idea that small numbers of workers placed in a strategic location in an industry or sector or an employer, and a particular employer can actually uh, apply leverage uh, to extract concessions or uh, success in achieving whatever their demands are. Um, and I, I, because of limited time, I'm not gonna go through each of these different possible scenarios, but I looked at that relationship and I'll come back to this in a little bit between organizational power and disrupt disruptive power. So I decided to focus on our own 
strike threat actually, uh, which is which was a, one of the largest strike threats during the, the five year period that I actually investigated strike threats. Um, and one of the reasons is because the California State University system, which is one of three higher education systems in the state of California, um, is the largest university system in the entire United States. Our union has 26,000 members on the 23 campus system that include uh, tenured, tenured line faculty, non-tenured faculty like myself, coaches, librarians, and counselors. Um, and what I found was that during the uh, a little bit longer than a year period from from the time that bargaining began until the strike was threatled, uh, settled, um, that the, the union, the California Faculty Association, effectively uh, organized uh, gradually escalating tactics uh, according to a strategy of advocacy and mobilizing. Bargaining, and I'll give you a little time frame. Uh, bargaining formally began in May 2015. It wasn't until September 2015 that an official threat to strike uh, was issued um, for April 13th, and that was intended to last five days, interrupted by a weekend. And then strike organizing in earnest actually didn't begin until February 2016. Um, however, a settlement was announced five days before the date to strike was to begin, um, and the membership voted a couple of weeks later, uh, almost overwhelmingly from those who showed up to actually vote. Um, to ratify that uh, that agreement. Uh, that agreement has since been rolled over twice without any further changes. Um, so I decided I was, because it's such a huge system, uh, I taught at two campuses and I was involved in helping with the, the, the rank and file grassroots efforts to, to organize the strike related uh, actions at both campuses. I decided I would pick uh, the two campuses where I was involved and I, um, and where I worked as well. So I focused on um, looking at the organizational, positional, and disruptive power uh, using what Jamie just very articulately described as class composition theory and also that Clark uh, gave us a little historical background to it. So I'm gonna uh, bypass explaining what that is again, but you know, I'm welcome, uh, you're welcome to, to ask questions about that a little bit. Uh, but as a brief overview, if you're not familiar with what organizational, positional, and disruptive power are, which I was referring to earlier, organizational power um, is, these are mainstream labor studies, sociological terms for explaining the relationship between workers, organizational power in the workplace, uh, positional power, their actual location in a firm or an industry, and disruptive power I mentioned earlier, the ability to apply leverage um, to extract concessions. So my particular focus was to do a worker's inquiry into whether or not our strike threat was credible, according to the definition I gave earlier. And I'm, I'm not gonna go into these scorecards because of the limited amount of time, but I developed uh, these scorecards as a way to, uh, to track a number of different issues. And these are actually in the chapter that's on the Google Drive, so you can look at this a lot closer. Um, and um, I, I developed a scorecard as a way to, uh, to evaluate uh, really how effective um, the strike organizing activity was in addressing uh, different component aspects of organizational, positional, and disruptive power. Um, and you can see on the total, the total score at the bottom right, um, we not only failed overall, um, but it was almost as if we didn't even show up to the fight. Um, I, I, came up with a score of 28.5% out of 100%. So just a miserable outcome. So was the strike credible? Um, so the way that uh, the conclusions I came to and the way that I looked at these different factors was first that um, what was called as a threat to strike was really primarily overly focused on advocacy, mobilizing, and bargaining. Uh, with very little effort to organize. Um, and, you know, uh, there's a lot of different details I could go into, but uh, one of the primary aspects was, um, as I mentioned in the timeline, um, it wasn't until the beginning of the spring 2016 semester that any effort to actually start organizing even began. 
um, at San Francisco State, the organizing was um, was undertaken by a group of rank and file faculty, primarily lecturers, um, with very little involvement from the statewide union or or really even the chapter at San Jose State. There was virtually no organizing at all. Um, and and from what I have in, in terms of information on the other 21 campuses, um, there was also this kind of mixed effort and also a very late start. Um, there was no workers inquiry in any remote related aspect at all that was done. Um, the union did several different uh, reports on salaries, on uh, the racial and gender composition of, of of the teaching staff, um, but that was never really woven into any of the organizing at all, um, and uh, a couple of other reports, but very, very little uh, information about the actual working conditions or who we were as members of faculty and the other uh, job categories, um, what our working conditions were, how we were organized, um, none of the other aspects of, of what Jamie described as the social or political composition um, were gathered at all. Um, there was no, there wasn't even a basic simple uh, survey that was done other than around what the issues for uh, striking would be uh, for bargaining purposes. Um, there was also no information um, about, so uh, overall there was no information about um, what um, we refer to as the technical composition of the organization of work or of any of the characteristics of who exactly we were as workers in, in the university system. So no, no understanding or analysis of, of the class composition of, uh, of who was being uh, organized and asked to strike. Um, Jane McAlevey, uh, um, who's an American uh, labor organizer, labor scholar, um, has developed what she calls a structure test um, to evaluate um, how committed um, workers are in a workplace or in a, for an employer or an industry towards actually taking strike-related action. Um, there was nothing remotely related to that that was done at all. Um, and what experience we had in doing that was um, we undertook an effort to knock on doors and essentially informally uh, query um, faculty and, and other members whether or not they would be willing to participate um, in any of the actions related to the strike. But overall, nothing remotely related to uh, what Matt Levy calls a structure test. There was also no effort to involve, as Jamie was talking about, um, with uh, some of the UCU uh, campus chapters efforts to bring in staff. Um, there are two uh, statewide uh, CSU uh, staff unions, in addition to our faculty and counselor union, um, neither of those um, unions and their members were involved in the effort. Also, there's thousands of ununionized uh, and unorganized uh, student teaching assistants and campus workers and graduate student employees. Um, none of them were, were brought into the effort as well. Um, while there were uh, gradually escalating efforts to, um, to intensify the tactics that were used around advocacy and mobilizing, such as lobbying, um, there, was, there was no gradual escalation of tactics to, to turn up the temperature, if you will, um, in the strike-related uh, organizing, which lasted really only about two months. Um, also, um, um, among the issues that were reported to the union, which were never um, released to the membership from the bargaining issue survey, um, none of the other issues that still remain prevalent um, concerns for many of the membership that come up in, in chapter meetings um, frequently um, were ever addressed or demanded. Um, the demands were limited to uh, uh, fight for uh, fight for five, five percent increase was the only demand that was made. Um, none of the issues of work control, uh, online, the massive expansion of online education, uh, uh, problematic issues around assessment and evaluation, um, and um, 
were dealt with. Uh, there was no issue, no, no demands around productivity such as class sizes, um, and also um, the massive expansion of, of contingent faculty. So as I mentioned, demands were limited just to uh, the demand of, of fight for 5%, 5% increase. So here I'm, I'm just kind of summarizing things that I go into in a lot more detail in the chapter, but overall, um, I, what I assessed was um, our, our effort to, uh, to strike uh, reflected a very low and even organizational positional power um, and no disruptive power whatsoever. Um, so that led me to, to ask this question of was our, was our strike threat credible? Um, and, and the conclusion that I drew was that it was incredible. Even though the system settled with us, um, gave us a, the 5% demand, uh, plus a couple of other percent that kind of rolled in over the next few years, um, and the overall assessment was that we actually settled um, with a loss um, that was uh, probably marginally less costly for the university um, than going through what would have been uh, a non-disruptive strike that probably would have had some cost to the system as a nuisance effect. In other words, bad publicity. So why was the threat not credible? Um, because it didn't meet either of the definitions of what um, I find to be uh, the basis for evaluating the credibility of a strike. It was neither credible to the boss, in this case the system, because as I mentioned, uh, they could settle for a, a small uh, wage increase, um, but that was in some ways, um, it was uh, neutralized by the reality that class sizes grew. So the productivity increase uh, offset uh, the wage uh, increase. And after years of frozen wages following the 2008-9 crash, um, uh, wages are still incredibly low. Uh, the other uh, concession to settle without going on a strike was uh, not having any limits to contingency, no conversion of contingent faculty um, to tenure line faculty, um, and also uh, the introduction of a new two-tiered uh, retiree healthcare benefit. So it wasn't credible to the system uh, because they could grant the small wage increase, uh, which came to about 14% over the three years, um, because the wage increase was offset by the gains that the system made uh, from the other two concessions. So essentially a short strike would have been a nuisance and probably slightly more costly to the system than uh, what they did concede. But I think m almost more importantly is that the strike threat was incredible to the membership. And you can see in the, the image on the slide of, of the t-shirt that was given out um, to many members, um, which effectively tells the system in advance, look, we don't really, we're not really serious about striking um, because we don't really want to strike. And um, what I found on the two campuses was that there wasn't really a lot of public sign of commitment um, by maybe more than a few hundred members on either campus where there's approximately 2,000 members on each campus um, or potential members because not everybody's a member of the union. Um, and there was very little public display. Um, and using McAlevey's idea of a structure test, it didn't demonstrate that there was a very high level of commitment of members that were willing to take that next step and actually uh, withhold their labor and go on strike. So the efforts of CFA to actually organize a strike um, was so poorly done that um, many, many of the faculty and the other uh, membership in that unit, in that unit uh, statewide did not make any public display of their commitment. In other words, they didn't expect the strike to happen, they didn't expect the strike to be successful, or they didn't expect very much to come from it. So overall, there were very few participating members at San Francisco State, um, and there were several different ways I gauged this, for example, through um, um, the public displays of commitment to strike, uh, participating in uh, signing up for uh, picket lines, uh, uh, showing up at tabling events and so forth. These are some of the examples of public commitments to strike. And as I mentioned before, San Jose State got started late. Um, there was the only door-to-door -door, 
knocking that was done was actually by student union interns who were hired literally a couple of weeks before uh, the settlement was issued. Uh, there were really no uh, activities, even the rallies were attended by just a few dozen people. Um, so that's kind of a, I hope I didn't go over time, I started the clock a little bit late, but um, so in from my inquiry into the effectiveness of uh, attempting to to organize um, a strike uh, in the CSUs um, that uh, overall it was not a credible effort. Thanks very much, Robert. Um, so we'll now pass on to um, Sophia Lacouris for some of her insights into inquiry regarding the university. Okay. Hi, everyone. Oh, I'm muted. No, I am okay. All right. Okay. Uh, so I will be very quick because we are a little bit behind. We started sort of later um, than we thought. And um, I had a film to show you, but you can watch it later. So I'm just going to put the, um, the link in the chat. And it, it also exists in the resources, this information. Uh, so I, I, I have no specialism myself in what is inquiry, uh, but it is um, a tool and a method that fascinates me. Um, and, and I want to, to sort of look at it a little bit from a feminist perspective and to bring to all of this um, the problem of the impossibility of the women's strike, um, which um, is uh, something that we use in a group I'm a member of, which is called um, Women's Strike Assembly, which is like a feminist um, uh, organization in the UK. Uh, I am also the equalities officer in the UC Edinburgh. So this is another, and that kind of relates to, to what I want to say. So, um, the feminist perspective brings into this um, the idea that there is unpaid work for which you cannot strike um, and also this brings to the precarious work for which people again cannot strike because they are not in unions and um, all these various problems and um, I, I found quite inspiring something that happened in Spain uh, in 2002, um, where there was um, a general strike and a group of women uh, who were precarious and uh, could not um, strike. Um, and, and, who, uh, and their names is Precarious a la Deriva, uh, decided to to walk through the city and to go and uh, visit the different pickets and ask people questions about the strike. Uh, and that has been described by some people as um, a, a picket survey. Uh, and they, they collected some information from this uh, and then um, they, they used the method of the situationists, uh, which was the idea of um, wandering in the city. Um, and and they, they created these drifts in the city, which were following uh, the journeys that these women were having all day to go from work and to do this and to solve this problem and all of that. And, and they were having discussions during all that. And they collected information in the same way other people have collected through the sort of normal workers inquiry um, and this material exists um, in the film that I have put the link there uh, which likely has an English translation it has English subtitles <laughs> but maybe you need to, to to make it play slower because the Spanish people speak really quickly and you know the subtitles are going like crazy <laughs> so I watched it myself in 75% in order to be able to to catch what is being said. Uh, and th they also produced a whole book uh, which has not been translated, which kind of really uh, 
you know, it's really strange that such a book hasn't been translated. Uh, and maybe we need to put some effort here in Edinburgh. We have a large Spanish community to translate that and through the SSN and, <laughs> and all of this. So, so yeah, so I just wanted to bring this idea um, into the table and um, and to just say, apart from, you know, these questions about what is working and what isn't working, who can strike and all of this, uh, there is also in, in this kind of stressful life and all these things that they have no name, there are these feelings and desires that I want to find a way to capture that, these things as well uh, in, in some sort of form. Uh, so, so, so I think that the work is inquiry uh, in the way other people have developed it is fantastic, but I'm just going to find this other little thing, this other little layer of how to deal um, with all these other things, whether we use drifts or I don't know what. We can discuss what we could use in Edinburgh. I have thought about certain things. Um, okay, so so yeah, you can watch that film later. And in the resources that Dante has put together, we have some other things. And at the very end, there are some links uh, for uh, the um, precarious Sala Deriva. And I'll stop here to pass on to Dante to talk about Edinburgh. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sophia. Um, I'll speak very quickly so we can have a quick break and then hopefully move on to discussion. So my main thing that I wanted to speak out was in a kind of similar way to Sphere about expanding the idea of a worker's inquiry is bringing in this element of, you know, student practice in the sense that, well, I think, at least for me as a student and I'm sure others as well, during the last, last few years of um, UC, UCU strikes, it's totally made us, you know, rethink, rearticulate what it means to be a student within university, make us then consider our own, our own labour within the university, our own work, um, become really aware of the fact that, you know, the university relies obviously on the work of the workers, but there's huge amounts of unpaid, unrecognized work that students do for the university. I'm sure lots of students are paid workers for the university, but equally there's lots of kind of reproductive work we have to do to ensure the university as a capitalist enterprise can reproduce itself, whether, you know, and I'm sure, you know, in different departments, it's different, you know, particularly in science, it's very different from what happen, happens in the humanities. But if we're aware that we have some kind of role within the reproduction of the university, then we equally, we know we have a political existence as students and a and a kind of class compositional existence of students. So I think an inquiry within the student community, whatever form it might take, needs to seize onto this fact. And it should be done in collaboration with a kind of more formal workers inquiry that happens by the you know, paid, labored, as, as, you know, university workers. And we can intervene in a sense as students and we should engage, engage as students in a practice ourselves. I think one of the central reasons we should do this is because there is this kind of ceaseless um, surveying of students about their existence, but all they really do is reinforce our, ex our existence as kind of, um, students as consumers, students who are simply there to buy prestige, to buy a kind of educational experience, to, you, to treat their educational and pedagogical existence as a commodity. But if we engage in our own work as inquiries, we can create a totally different image of what we do as students at university. You know, it's a kind of demystify the rhetoric of the university manage about management about who we are as university students to recognize that we are work we are workers in many senses and um, that we reproduce the university it's a good way of intervening in the kind of discourse around students that happens at the moment and has been increasingly as universities become increasingly marketized um, and i think in some sense you know the staff student solidarity network has done this a little bit we try and gather testimony from students about their own experiences and there's things happening on campus regarding um, like the blackhead movement in edinburgh which has been doing really good stuff on thinking about racial justice and gaining testimony from workers and students, which, you know, in a sense, we want to try and mirror, mirror some of their work, but to think about it um, in terms of the fact that we reproduce the university students. So I just wanted to speak briefly on this fact to think that we should, as much as the foundation of the Staff Student Solidarity Network is to break down the binaries of students and workers, we should do that in an inquiry practice as well. You know, the inquiry should reveal the way in which we function as a kind of community within the capitalist space that is the university. That's my suggestion. Hopefully, you know, maybe we can discuss it in the future. Um, so now I think we're going to have a, you know, a few minute break just so everyone can have a rest and um, maybe think of some ideas from some discussion. So I'll unmute people so, you know, you can have a discussion or you can go on a break as well. And then in about five minutes time, we'll come back together, have a 20 minute, half an hour discussion, and then we'll formally end. But then after that, we're going to leave the kind of Zoom call open so everyone can just kind of chat more freely, come up with ideas, share details with one another and start kind of brewing up new ideas for the future. Perfect. Yes. I'll let you all unmute yourselves.
I'll pause the recording as well. When are we convening again in like five minutes, you say? Yeah, we'll say, yeah, five minutes. That's cool. And um, you feel that management is also engaged in these kind of processes of optimizing us and uh, uh, I mean, apparently pretending to deal with equalities issues and and this and that and and that also that in a way seem to often end up sort of reifying boundaries as Dante was saying and and creating resources for di divide and rule um tactics so i guess i had a question about um how about differentiation and you know how to how to separate out this the, these kind of processes and i mean some of the answers of organizing and so on um and i was related to that i wonder how um this is i guess a question for jamie particularly and and robert um or and anybody else on the um who's here who's actually engaged in a workers inquiry i mean how does management respond um what's the and then ha what about these people who are in between workers and managers and, and go either way these so that's also a differentiation question anyway we can we'll start the kind of official q a session now then if there's anyone who wants to follow up on Sophia's question go ahead if you you i'll unmute the jamie and robert first and if they want to respond and then can pass it open up um yeah i mean i guess i i have one kind of anecdote to, to say about this that might be helpful um and this is one of those things that like i'm never sure whether people believe me when i say this about whether it actually happened or not, but you'll just have to, you'll have to take my word for it. Um, when I was doing this inquiry in a, in a call center, so I worked in this call center for six months, uh, I found out there was another person working undercover in the call center, um, except he blew his cover, um, basically because he, he didn't want people to think that he would be a call center worker. Uh, and so he told us all that he was actually a consultant uh, and that the work was really beneath him and so on. Um, and basically he'd been hired by the company to basically to work both sides of the call center, so the inbound and the outbound work and figure out why the outbound sales was performing so badly and the inbound was doing much better. So, I mean, the reason I said this anecdote is that we have to think about the politics of the knowledge involved. Um, and often there are things that you know, we might not want to publicize that come out of inquiries of like structural weaknesses or things that, you know, a kind of classic example of this is like, you know, when you do inquiries with workers, you find out there are ways that people like get around the rules at work and steal things or like get paid for work they haven't done and so on. And that's really political knowledge because, you know, if you publish about that and say, what a wonderful resistance strategy, you can guarantee no one else is going to get free food or extra pay or, or, or so on again. And so I think part of this is about thinking through like the politics of, of what we're doing, what goes said, what goes unsaid, um, and realizing that actually like, you know, inquiry can be used by capital. You know, Taylor famously went and worked in a, a steel mill to steal, steal knowledge from, from workers about how their work was organized and use it to, 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 to exploit them. Um, yeah, I think that I think that's well said, Jamie. You know, it, it's no accident that a lot of deans and vice presidents have all been faculty members. You know, I, I even I even taught in one community college, um, where the president of the campus had been the president of our union local <laughs> before I got there. Uh, so, um, but I think to your point, uh, Sophia. Um, if I maybe I mispronounced your name, I'm sorry. Um, but I think it's a good one. 
um, in, in two regards. And on, on one hand, of course, administrators are trying to reproduce these divisions because they want to maintain it. They want to manage us, right? Um, and to Jamie's point, you know, they're constantly gathering data and information about us, right? And uh, this really became uh, explosive at San Jose State a few months ago um, when uh, one of my friends who uh, is involved in the Academic Senate, which is the non-union governance body that we call the Senate in U.S. higher education, um, she, um, she was shown um, she was shown an Excel list of thousands of students uh, who were at risk of failing when we went all online. Um, they had harvested this information by going into all of our uh, Canvas. We use this online platform called Canvas and uh, monitoring which students were not turning in their work and had Fs. Um, and then they whittled it down to a few hundred students and they sent these automated messages to these students saying, you know, you're at the risk of failing. And we're now trying to use this as an organizing tactic to show that, you know, we're very at risk online, even more so that they have ubiquitous constant data surveillance and they can assess us and evaluate us and the contract is silent on that. Um, so um, understanding the way that we're managed is also on the flip side an important tool for understanding what we call the technical composition is on the flip side necessary for understanding how to organize ourselves because we have to organize where we find ourselves. And so we need that full picture, the same picture that management has of who's who, where do we work, where are we located, where's all the membership because that's where we have to reach people. And it's not just for the purpose of organizing ourselves effectively to have that kind of power but it also gives us a picture of how the university is currently organized and how we would want to organize it differently. You know, in, you know, in getting past capitalism, do we want to keep our system of higher education? How would we organize it, right? So that information that management has, they use it to control and exploit us, but we also need that information to reach everybody in the workplace to be able to organize ourselves. And so that was, I think, one of the biggest failings of our strike threat was that our union never even thought of doing that. They just did a very passive survey. What do you think the issues of bargaining should be? And that's what all of our unions do. I belong to five different faculty unions over the decade and a half I've taught. And that's all they do. And even the surveys are not, the survey results are not released to us. Um, you also mentioned something about the in-between layers. And again, you know, I think that's a critical question. And I personally don't believe, for example, that department chairs should be uh, members of our union. In fact, San Jose State, our brand new chapter president, who was just elected a few months ago, uh, is a department chair. And I think that there's a divided loyalty in that. You know, department chairs are like, you know, Frederick Taylor's foreman. You know, they were the worker who they promoted a little bit to oversee other workers and extract their knowledge and institutionalize it. And that's what department chairs are. I, I'm not that familiar with the internal structure of UK higher education, uh, but department chairs are the lowest level of management, but they also are academic laborers, um, but they hire and fire and evaluate us. And you know, um, so uh, I think if, if that's what your second question was about, I, I think that's an important issue that, you know, that needs to be addressed as well. Perfect. Thanks. Um, we'll pass over to Silva now. And if anyone wants to um, uh, speak, please just put an, an asterisk in the chat. Um, so I guess I was going to ask about how do we ensure that it is the workers speaking to the academics rather than the academics speaking to the workers in a uni setting? Because I could totally see where we're in a setting where a large portion of the workers have this knowledge of academia and of not workers inquiries but inquiries in general and of how the academic process works and then you've got other people like cleaners or security guards who just like lack that knowledge and how do we ensure that it doesn't feel sort of unequal 
because they don't have that knowledge and they then feel like they're being spoken to rather than than having an equal ability to be telling their own story. Um, Yeah, I I think I I have thought about this, um, Silver, a lot. Um, I, I think um, it, it relates to the everyday relationships with people and to um, how long we spend with people and sort of talking. And um, m- myself, because I spend longer time in the building than other people because I don't have commitments of children and all of this. Um, I know a lot more about the, the janitors and they talk to me and I know where the things are. So, for example, but I don't know where the cleaners are because I'm not there that early in the morning, you know, these kinds of things. Um, so I, I think all of this relates to, to how we live our lives in, the, in this workplace w- with other people and to not let in um, the system dictate who we are and who are the people or like myself i spent all this time with the students in all these kind of different rather than with my colleagues which is a specific way of kind of breaking that boundary and we 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 need to try to do that and then it will become more normal to to have these conversations i think it seems to me that's the Um, if we're here, we'll hear from Clark and then from Fred. Cheers. Yeah, no, I think that's a really interesting point. And like, especially in the way in which you relate to workers that are not necessarily, especially in university, non-academic workers, but like you mentioned the cleaners and security guards, or, or janitors rather, Sophia. I remember coming in in the morning because we worked in the same place and always chatting with cleaners about just this and that at the workplace. And um, in fact, I used to work at a different university in a library on a, doing night shifts. We actually had a really interesting shift pattern where our employers were expecting us to train uh, outsourced security guards to actually do our own jobs. And we were, of course, at the time, were on uh, very insecure contracts. So all of us instantly were politicized when they asked us to do this because we thought, what the hell is this? We're training people who are getting paid to do the same work as us as a lower, at a lo- sorry, getting paid at a lower rate to do the same labor as us. And also to potentially replace us. We're not idiots. We see this. And there was a, we encountered like quite a lot of, of issues because as I worked as a library assistant with other, mainly other students, uh, PhD students, uh, master's students, things like that. And there was a, a very noticeable rift between the way in which most of these people would talk to security guards when we shared a shift and would uh, share conversations with them. Most people actually really didn't. They just ignored the security guards um, and were just generally disgruntled at what they had to do. And the few of us that, that would uh, talk with people uh, with security guards, it wasn't, we didn't assume any kind of academic uh, air. There was nothing really academic about it. It wasn't that anyone was being spoken to. Um, and we kind of had the mentality of, of basically learning as much from the security guards um, as from anyone else. And nothing really, I mean, this wasn't a workers' inquiry or anything. This is just, or maybe it is actually, it was a workers' inquiry, just not something that was written or published. Um, and I think that's just the main kind of approach, just being kind of human, decent solidarity with other people, exchanging experiences and learning from people. I think this is the main starting point developing any kind of conducive conversation or research in this area is to actually try and eliminate perhaps that academic mindset um but i don't know it's just a thought um i think fred wants to speak as well uh, that's i don't know jamie did you want to did you want to jump in on this point because i was going to raise something else um yeah, I guess I just wanted to say one thing thing very quickly on this is um, 
it, I think it also depends about how you, in what way you're trying to organize. Um, so, you know, I'm a member of the lecturers union, but I'm also a member of IWGB. Um, and so we organize industrially across the university. So everyone's in the same, in the same branch. And I think, you know, I, I think what people have said previously, I think is really excellent about, you know, talking to people, you know, these are the kind of the, the real first steps. But I think the other thing to remember is, you know, a lot of the cleaners that, that we organize within London, a lot of the security guards are migrant workers. Um, and, you know, many of the security guards I know were engineers, uh, you know, they were lawyers in, in the country they came from, you know, they uh, have experience writing, uh, you know, there's even a, a cleaner who was a, who was a judge before, you know, so they wrote every day in work before they came to the UK. So I think we also need to be careful in assuming that people don't have other experience or don't write in their personal life or aren't used to writing. Um, but the worker writing project for me has been fascinating for this because you talk to people who want, you know, they want, a lot of the people who are writing for us want to write, but are constantly told by people they shouldn't, they have nothing to say, their English isn't good enough. And just a couple of afternoons of sitting with people and saying, just put words down, you know, is if you give people permission to do something, sometimes, you know, all that creativity starts flowing out of people. Um, and so I think it's about, we can give people a space to, to do writing, um, which is kind of weird in a way. It's like, you think the power relation might go the other way around, that like people would be scared of writing with people who write for a job. But actually, if you encourage somebody, it's like they think you're somebody who knows about writing. So that weirdly gives you a permission to say, you know, you can write about your own experience. Uh, and I think that's where I think the role the academic can play is in opening up a space on the campus. It's like we have the time and the resource and, and so on to do some of these things. So we should, we should figure out ways to do it to help other people. Yeah, um, I think that's beautiful what everyone said. I think it just really strikes me how much our ideas of like what research or inquiry looks like gets in the way of actually doing that work. And I think often our ideas of like what union organizing looks like or who's in a union gets in the way of doing that work as well. Um, Kind of related to that, and I wanted to, Robert, when you were talking about credible strike threats, it just really struck me, and I was in a union meeting today talking about this, that UCU strike threats aren't necessarily, like, by your criteria, aren't credible, right? Like, like we've, we've just come off the most sustained period of strike action in UK higher education ever. We've effectively made no gains. And it's because us taking you know, upwards of six weeks of strike action doesn't cost the employer more. They, they save money on wages, right? Um, what we rely on is being disruptive. And I think something really key here is that there's a lot of talk about marking strikes in relation to this, but there's also a lot of talk about students suing universities for fees. Um, and that becomes the point at which we cause them like real financial damage. Um, and this relates to the way that um, Dante was talking about this as well, and I'm, and I'm basically wondered if you guys could talk about, I mean, the only way that we do real, we become credible strike threats to the university is by working with students and mobilizing students. Um, I think there's a logic in the UCU at the minute that being too militant, taking too serious action alienates students. I wonder what you thought about the role that Workers' Inquiry has in building those kinds of affinities and building power. Um, and I mean, I'm thinking about projects like Wages for Students, which is, I suppose, like a kind of like in the US in the 1970s was a kind of like students for Workers' Inquiry. And then the sort of strategic actions that you can take as staff and as students. Like I'm a PhD student. Often as a worker, I have less power than I do than as a customer. I think there are, there are points at which we've seen precarious UCU members organizing as students and being more effective than they can if they organize as workers. Um, and where you sort of, how you see that question of whether students can be workers, whether students should be thinking about what they give as labor. Um, sorry, this is a really rambling and wide question, but I just wondered if you could speak about some of these issues in relation to the workers inquiry. Can I go ahead? 
Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, yeah, so uh, I'm glad you brought up wages for students. Um, this is really what got me to start looking at the university as a, as a center of, of capitalism. It's what I wrote my master's thesis and dissertation about. And it was kind of a primitive workers inquiry, um, looking at the university's restructuring in the 80s and 90s uh, as a corporation from the perspective of students. Um, so I think the, the thing that's most valuable for me that comes out of the wages for students movement uh, efforts um, is understanding how students struggle and looking at that and then being able to extract various tactics and strategies that would also connect with how others in the university are also struggling. Wages for students can help us understand how students are refusing work all the time. And that should also inform how the rest of us in the university are also organizing and struggling. Um, now, in terms of like, um, you know, what you were saying about your UCU strikes and how they weren't credible because they didn't really demonstrate much cost to the system uh, from the strike. Um, I think in order for academic strikes to really apply more leverage and be more disruptive, we've got to go um, beyond just the boundaries of the university. I think we really have to look at upstream and downstream of the university, right? And this is where it ties into the wages for students analysis, is what's the purpose of a university in the first place? I think if I ask the, six, the 15 of you this, we might get 15 different answers or variations on a few answers, right? But for me, looking at it from a class analysis, the university exists to, to discipline and manufacture labor power. Um, and as a result, everybody who works in the university is also a worker whose labor is exploited for the purpose of producing labor power. Now, of course, you know, research universities are also producing intellectual property, which is used to manage and discipline and control workers elsewhere in the capitalist economy. But at the fundamental basis, we haven't yet grasped, with the, we haven't really grasped the, the key purpose of the university, which is to, to produce exploitable labor power, right? And until we do that, our strikes are not gonna be very effective because we need to connect the university with the downstream flows of what's feeding the university and the upstream flows, what's the university feeding. Ultimately, most university strikes, the, the employers are just sitting back and waiting until the strike dwindles, right? And so the cost of disruption might be lower than actually conceding some of your demands because we, we're, we're disconnected, we're isolated, we're not part of the larger circulation of capital in the, in the regional or global economy. And until we're able to do that, um, I think we're gonna see more strikes and, and strike threats that are just not credible and not very effective. Yeah, I, I, I agree with, with much of what Robert said. I just want to add a couple of comments before, before dropping off. I mean, I think, you know, I think a big part of this is thinking about how inquiry can help us to find our strength and our points of leverage. Uh, and one of the debates that's gone round and round and round in UCU is that we don't, there's never been a discussion about strategy. There's never been a discussion about what will lead to a victory. Instead, it's like, we'll go through the motions, we'll have a two-day strike or a, uh, a week-long strike or, or whatever it is, because that's what industrial action is. So we'll do that. No one has ever seriously sat back and thought, well, actually, where is our leverage? And, you know, I think one of the big challenges for UCU is the reality is, for most academics, you know, I cannot go into work for a week, two weeks. You know, if I'm very rarely needed on the campus in a serious way, but actually withdrawing my labor for that length of time, as Robert says, has very little impact on the university as an institution. And one of the things we find with, with uh, strikes with cleaners and security guards is actually because of the role of, of many universities as kind of parts of the city with expensive real estate, with you know, expensive buildings, with student halls and so on, actually the leverage of many of the, the non-academic workers is much higher. 
um, you know, if you leave a lab with no security uh, or you don't clean a building for a day, like the functioning of the university grinds to a halt much quicker. Now, of course, this is a bit of a difficult thing for many academics to admit. Um, and it's one of the reasons why UCU doesn't, I think, take seriously the building of alliances with less skilled or lower paid workers or so on. And I think one of the tasks for university inquiries is to say whether we're in the union together or not, we will support each other's struggles. We'll find ways to, we're not in the same union to coordinate strike days together, is to think just because the organizational forms that we have at the moment are the way they are, doesn't mean our struggles have to be limited in that way. Um, and, you know, I think there's also, you know, there's massive things that academics can learn from the patterns of struggles of, uh, of other workers, you know, particularly in London, the Latin American migrants that work as cleaners, you know, bring traditions of struggles. You know, their picket lines are way more exciting because they come with this energy from, from struggles in Latin America and is finding how to cross fertilize between the two because we want to stop the university in order to win. Um, and that means, that means building alliances much more widely than, than, than many of the unions are compared to do. Um, but yeah, I just want to say thank you so much for, for inviting uh, me along to talk and I really look forward to hearing more about what your project uh, turns into in Edinburgh so yeah very very happy to help in any way I can. Cheers Jamie um, I, as I know there's no asterisk I'll really if I like to raise a quick question of my own. Um, it's kind of following from the last two points from Robert and Jamie is that a lot of the things we've discussed in the South Solidarity Network is are the universities placed within the city like you know on a level of capital level like you know materially and edinburgh i don't know if it's how unique it is but you know so much of the money seems to come from building development projects things like that or at least that's what it invests lots of money in so if we think about workers in careers are also a way of situating work within the city because it also sees you know what are the limits of the you know edinburgh university's existence as a capitalist site it goes into you know work sites with builders or these all these other things you know that goes slightly beyond the academic remit or just you know the people working on campuses the cleaners or or non-academic workers or um security guards which we've been mentioned is like you know an inquiry can really it would be interesting to see how you could push it to see, think about edinburgh's place within the city maybe you know how unique this is to edinburgh but you know you think about all the things with the fringe and the edinburgh festival and how the edinburgh university is really well distributed into all these other things which have seemingly have nothing to do with academic work or research but you know, provide huge amounts of capital for the university, or at least that's where they move money through. So it resituates what the university is and when Edinburgh is such a bizarre university and how it like situates itself within the city. Cool. If there's any other points, again from Robert. Well, I think this is a really important point. I would even take it another level and I don't know how this works in the UK, but um, there's a higher educators group that I talked about before we got online um, on the East Coast. And they've been looking at, and this was done in the University of California system about a decade ago too, when there were some strikes. They're looking at the financial markets and how the universities in the US really rely on the bond markets um, in order to borrow. Um, there's various kinds of financial instruments that are used. Um, they can issue their own bonds and, and things like that to build buildings and stuff like that. Um, but I think that, you know, if you think about the impact and the cost of borrowing and how that fluctuates when there's evidence of class conflict and class struggle, that's also a way to incorporate, you know, that kind of analysis you're talking about of the university and the city. Not only universities are in cities in the United States, you know, many of them are in small towns and rural. Um, but you know, thinking outward, you know, expanding the focus outward to think about the financing structure and how corporations respond to the instability of the universities. You know, we've gone through now almost 40 years of so-called reform and that whole reform effort is the impetus of the corporate sector. You know, they've been arguing for decades, workers aren't productive enough. In other words, they don't work hard enough. Um, you know, students are taking too long to get out of the university. In other words, you know, they don't know how to complete their work, right? And so if you, if you think about the impact of the university in these different ways in terms of the, the so-called quality of the labor that they're producing or how they're financed, those can also be other 
you know, disruptive forms of leverage that can be incorporated into strike related actions, for example. Yeah, that's again, really, really interesting. I think, I think one of the things in Edinburgh that we're seeing, and especially in the push to bring back on campus teaching at huge risk to students and to staff and to all workers in the university, right, is that teaching is something that can in most cases be done online, right? Like this is like, that's, there's, there's a way of changing that technological composition of the work. One of the things that Edinburgh is really aware of is that they rely on like selling this experience of living in Edinburgh, living in the city. Um, they make a lot of money off accommodation that they like directly own, but they also rely in many ways on the impact that the university has on the housing market in Edinburgh, right? And the really very, like a lot of their like, the, um, like building developments, there's a huge part of university income and borrowing uh, relies on the Edinburgh construction market and housing market. And I think that's, it's been really interesting to see that, well, that, that's been laid very, laid bare very clearly by the desire of the university to bring on-campus teaching very quickly in September. Um, there was a group that was doing something about this after the student occupation in 2018. Clark, were you around for that? I can't remember the name of. There was a student group that was working on this, but I can't remember what their name was. I'm not sure either. I can't remember either. Um, I was, yeah. Are you talking about the Safely Walk project? No, it was it was a group that came out of the teach house that took place in the lecture in the occupied lecture theatre. Oh, um, doing, doing what? University in the city or something or or who's something. From from the that occupation we I remember we did have quite a few teach outs discussing that and then Oh yeah, we had we had I mean we had one event afterwards which was about the urban struggles. I don't know if that's what you meant. Um, where we talked about uh, the, the various problems with the buildings and we had some films from other cities, from Berlin and all of that. Maybe maybe it was that. But that, that was really related to the Save Leith. The, the Save Leith walk, Robert, which you, you don't know that is, that we are talking here. Um, it's... Um, is an area like three minutes from where I am right now, my my place, uh, which is um, a listed building um, that the university wanted. Uh, the, the the university um, have a developer who kind of bought that build that section. It's a huge thing, and it was a community full of shops and cafes and things, and they blocked all of that. And it is um, a like a ground floor with just one one floor um, and and they wanted to build seven floor uh, student accommodation and very large like like it was like five blocks of like seven floor um, and and they kicked all the 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 people who were using the shops and they boarded everything and it's like a boarded thing now uh, but we managed to block it because we had um, a residence sort of group here who managed to block that. Uh, and in that event that Fred talks about, we were trying to connect all the types of urban struggles together because we have very strong rental rent unions that are, are fighting for low rents in general and the student rents. and the rents problem is comes together with the development projects because because the two things sort of support each other when you keep building then the rents go up uh, so, so we were trying to just create this discussion of the sort of urban struggles and in relation to the university uh, so that's one example and, and also the demolitions are part of it's not just the development is what they are demolishing which is like the dem demolishing buildings but also community space uh, so i think it was that fred but i'm not 100 percent sure um, 
<laughs> well, yeah, they, they are building tram as well. <laughs> building the tram as well. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so a few more or less said what I was going to say as well. Um, but just about that um, Save Leith Walk campaign as well, I just thought additionally that's a really good example of students at the university actually going out and engaging with the local community and kind of breaking down that barrier of seeing the university as like a little colony in Edinburgh, breaking down that idea of the student bubble um, and hopefully also like in the minds of, of local people in Edinburgh rather than seeing the effects of this kind of gentrification and these new buildings that are always yeah, increasing rent and destroying communities um, actually seeing students resist that and show some solidarity with people in Edinburgh. Really, really good example of that, the, the Save Leith Walk stuff. So I was just going to say perhaps now it'd be good if we stop the recording and the formal discussion and maybe we could just enter into kind of a free, more open discussion if people were around to stay and if people <clears> have to head off. If that's all right with everyone. <clears throat>